Um, so before we start the official part, first of all, we are super happy everybody's here. We are super happy we have so many people online. We are happy to have you here with us, uh, our dear speakers and our speakers online. Um, but yeah, before we start officially, there are a few little things. So we need everybody that is not a speaker who's uh, online right now to best switch off their cameras and definitely keep their microphones off. This will just improve the quality of the stream. On your left side of the screen, there is a chat function. And so if you have any information for us or for the speakers or generally for everybody else, uh, or you have questions later, you can use the chat function. Please uh, use the respectful language. Um, and also up there on, on top of the, of the chat, you will find three links. Actually, the YouTube one is not working. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but there is also a link to Piano, and we have an ongoing discussion on Piano about the European election, the European Parliament elections next year. Um, we started last week already, and there are quite some interesting comments in there. But you, you can join right now. You can also join afterwards. We are not closing it yet. And then the, the last thing is a link to the evaluation form that uh, after the event you will be sent automatically, hopefully, to this evaluation form. So um, that's it. And now we can introduce our speakers. <laughs> yes, so we will start uh, with the online speakers. So first of all, we have with us online uh, Magdalena Karenba from the Open Plan Foundation. Uh, then we have uh, Ramatulay Dukwe from Senegal, from the platform des femmes pour la plus en casamance. Um, then we have uh, Dr. Magda Charota, who will join maybe later. She's stuck in the train right now. So yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> Brexit is uh, <laughs> stopping her from joining us. But hopefully, she will be able to join later. She's from Lancaster like, University. Um, then we have with us uh, Pega Mulana. Um, I don't, did you, ah, oh, yes, we're here, sorry. Uh, so from the Youth and Environment Europe. Uh, then online with us, we also have Katarina Ditz from OMAS for Future. Uh, I can't see you anymore. Did you turn on Yeah, our, our speakers, please keep your cameras on. Uh, it's just everybody else who should uh, switch it off. Uh, but just for a bit of context, OMAS in German means uh, grandmother. So uh, it's the grandmother's for the future, but she will explain that to you later in any case. Hi, Katarina. And then in the room with us, let me show you our key speakers. Oh, <laughs> so we have uh, Anna Gershen from Deutsche Naturschutze. <laughs> Very good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Anja Krenz from Jiuchi Berlin, and they will introduce themselves afterwards. Let's go back to online, and uh, we will start with Clara. Clara, can you? No, no, wait. First, no. I think first, okay. before, I, I know everybody's waiting for that. Yeah, that's true. But uh, before we start, we just wanted to tell you a few words about the project. Yeah. So this event is part of the EU24 Engage for the Planet project. Uh, it's a two-year project um, co-financed by the European Union. Um, yeah, and it's uh, our main goal is to bring together the citizens from diverse backgrounds uh, to increase democratic engagement. Um, and yeah, we have uh, five countries in this project, or five partner organizations. Um, so we are here at the CRN uh, from Germany. We have ALDA from France. We have Otwarte Plan from Poland. We have, um, well, former changemaker, almost there, from Sweden. And then we have uh, IGEA alumni from the Netherlands. And uh, when it comes to the climate crisis, because that's our main topic in, in those discussions that we organize in the project. We have like the, the four main topics, which is 
social, social climate justice, mobility, energy, and food production. And uh, what we've done until now, we started in November last year, and actually Anya was there. It, it was a kickoff project uh, meeting in, in Berlin. There were five speakers, and actually uh, I joined the project later, so I was there as a guest. But it was a great event, and I was super excited to meet everyone there, so I'm, I'm happy to see you again. Um, then we met in May in Krakow, where we were testing different types of debates and ways of debating. Um, looking for optimal ways to do it online and offline. Um, then later we met in September uh, in Strasbourg and we discussed mobility. And now we are here today. <laughs> and um, just for a larger picture, so Camilla and I are um, project managers for this project called EU24 that we just presented. And we are part of the Comparative Research Network, CRN, that was founded in 20, uh, 2007. And we mostly work in the field of uh, education and research, adult education, and specialize in many different fields, such as um, migration, mobilities, um, learning, intergenerational learnings. Um, yeah, and the aim of this specific event is to highlight the specific consequences of climate crisis on women uh, and um, to give women that are working in this field uh, the floor to share their experiences, their work, their um, thoughts on the questions. And we also have the goal of developing an online platform, online democracy platform to try to reinforce democracy uh, online and for it to be more available for everyone. So now, finally, I'll go back to the speakers. <laughs> uh, they're going to present themselves starting online with uh, Magdalena Klamen back from the Open Plan Foundation. Uh, thank you, Maxime. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Magdalena Klarenbach Clara from Open Plan Foundation in Krakow. Uh, we are educational and research organization that was established in 2014. So we are uh, nine years old already. Uh, I, we have a different uh, different fields of our expertise, but today I will focus on the topic that is that is related to to our debate. So it's a climate crisis, and I would like to present you different activities that we do, and yes, and what we do in Open Plan. So if you can um, present another slide, please. We started the uh, the climate education uh, five years ago with a workshop for children here in Krakow and around Krakow. Uh, but uh, three years ago, we started to, to do climate education a bit in a different way. So we started with intersectionality and the seminar about climate crisis and uh, racism. Um, uh, together with Anya Dankowska, she's one of the experts, um, on uh, climate related issues. We started with the seminar, the seminar is ongoing, but each year we focus on a different uh, aspect of the climate crisis. This year it was more inter, uh, intersectional and related to European uh, issues. Uh, here you can see the, the uh, brochure that we produced in the project. It was about, I think, the, the aspect that is not that popular in the Eastern countries. So it's a uh, coloniality and the heritage of the coloniality and intersectionality in terms of um, the movement itself, climate movement itself. So if you can uh, show another slide, please. Here you can see a bit uh, of our brochure as well and the idea of the differences between the mainstream and uh, intersectional climate movement. Uh, of course, later on, we can uh, give you the resources as well. Uh, if you can show another slide. So what exactly we do? Uh, we, as I said, we do workshops, we do seminars, but, but as well, we do campaigns. And here you can see the pictures from our eco residences because we uh, have the interdisciplinary approach as well. So we try to to gather community of different uh, different people. In here, they were artists, researchers, and activists from Poland. 
and uh, we organized a project uh, around climate crisis, uh, which end up with the video manifest on climate crisis. Another, please. Next slide. But our our ideas, our actions are as well intergenerational. Here you can see the beginnings of each chapter of the publication, which is called Between Hope and Grief. Here you have the, the texts of young activists from Poland uh, and different ideas, different emotions that they have around the climate crisis and uh, different ideas how to, to work with climate crisis. Um, so as you can see, there are the ideas of grief, but as well uh, ideas of hope. Um, another one, please. Yeah, here are uh, the, the two next artists. And I think that, that it's the most important things about Open Plan Foundation. So our intersectional, intergenerational, and interdisciplinary approach to climate crisis in our work uh, in here. Thank you very much. So, um, now we will have the presentation of uh, Thomas Lai de Coulé. The presentation will be, I think, in French, so then I will translate it to you. How much lighter for the Bonjour, c'est Ramakula de Pure de la plateforme de Femme pour la paix en Casamance. Uh, donc, j'ai adhéré des mouvements associatifs en 1999 comme relais communautaire, soit Sénégal. Ensuite, j'ai occupé plusieurs postes de responsabilité au sein de mon association et je sensibilise, je forme les femmes qui sont en milieu urbain ainsi qu'en milieu rural sur la santé de la reproduction des femmes et des adolescents avec cette forme, l'hygiène et l'assainissement avec la fondation l'édification de la paix avec ce et ça qui sont des projets de résolution en production liés à la gestion des ressources naturelles et de l'environnement. Et pour que ces conflits n'alimentent pas le grand conflit casamancé, la PFPC a contribué à travers ma personne à la sensibilisation au renforcement de capacité des populations, surtout en milieu rural, la gestion concertée et rationnelle des ressources naturelles à travers une formation localement connue par l'État sénégalais. Conscient que nous assistons à un réel changement climatique, chaque année, au moins nous reboisons 2000 arbres cette année, nous reboisons au moins 2000 arbres avec euh, les villageois et les services techniques de l'État. Je responsabilise chaque village pour l'entretien de ces arbres. Ces reboisements sont accompagnés par une caravane de sensibilisation sur la dégradation des ressources et de l'environnement. Je forme les femmes sur la production de charbon écologique pour éviter la carbonisation. J'ai mis l'accent sur la formation de femmes en leadership pour les permettre d'accéder aux instances de prise de décision pour la gestion des ressources naturelles. Pour, comme résultat, nous avons, nous avons obtenu six femmes six, qui sont des présidents du comité de gestion des ressources naturelles euh, des, des villages. Ok. Tu, euh, vous avez encore d'autres choses à ajouter? Euh, donc, euh, comme je, je viens de vous dire, 
mon intervention, j'ai mis l'accent sur le savoir-faire, la gestion des ressources naturelles et de l'environnement et la protection des ressources. Merci, je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Euh, vous avez dit beaucoup de choses, donc je vais essayer de, de résumer, mais ça va être un petit peu jeu. So, um, just to be precise, I'm going to take back the bio that I have of you. So, um, Ramatulay Dukuri is from um, this uh, Casamance that she describes as a haven of peace, uh, happiness, and perfect habitation. And she has been um, working uh, and involved in associative movements with uh, women's promotion groups since 1999. Uh, she went on to take on many responsibilities within these movements. Um, firstly, as a community health relay, then as a multi-purpose relay um, with the SWAA Senegal project. She has worked on uh, several projects as a community relay Uh, before becoming a project manager in one of uh, this, this sort of projects. Um, her main focus is always women's and adolescent health, and uh, she has held a lot of positions as head of the women's saving and um, mutual credits. She has also been the head of the women's advisory committee. Um, Um, what is really important is that Ramatoulé uh, Toukouré has um, worked a lot with uh, natural resources and the first special interests are natural resources and protection of those resources and the health uh, of women and the youngest. Um, and um, today she is a facilitator with the platform Les Femmes pour la Paix en Quesanos. Um, she is doing some projects called Ali, Ali Willy uh, One, Ali Willy Two, and Ali Willy Extension projects. Uh, she's partnering with some other organization, and her role is to raise awareness on conflict man management, women's leadership, peace building in villages uh, bordering the Guinea. Guinea. Um, and today she is one of the leading women member of this platform. And uh, she has been committed to peace uh, for the entire population for more than two decades. Okay, thank you. Um, then, <laughs> um, what? Um, then it would have been Dr. Magda Charota, but I don't think she managed to join yet. So we're going to move now to Pega Mulema. Uh, Pega, I leave you the floor. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes, I even heard myself. myself. Well, maybe Camilla maybe and Olympus can mute yourselves. Yeah. Let's try. Yeah, maybe that would be better for the people that are online. Uh, I don't I don't think it would do you a favor hearing me twice. So uh, <laughs> let's go this way. But uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pega Milana, and I'm very excited to be here, actually. Um, and uh, I am currently the Secretary General of uh, Youth and Environment Europe. It is a youth-led organization um, which operates on a pan-European level and um, And we specifically work uh, with young people about environmental issues. Um, we we mainly um, have member organized. We are very much member based, membership based. So we have 48 members across Europe, and uh, I'm very proud of them actually because um, they are really what shapes the organization. And uh, and namely the work that we do is uh, we try to raise awareness um, and build capacity of young people 
on environmental issues. So you can name the areas that we work on. It starts with biodiversity and goes all the way to oceans and Arctic. So we, we work on an array of thematic topics um, and, and empower young people through capacity building. Um, we also enhance international cooperation and knowledge sharing. So um, often there are many journeys that we have gone um, in understanding how young people and, and especially marginalized communities uh, are affected by certain environmental issues. And uh, we try to act as a bank of resources um, for other organizations and, uh, and institutions um, where they can make use of those resources. And lastly, which is very timely, we have just sent um, our delegation to COP28 uh, from the United Nations Framework on Climate Change uh, to Dubai. So we try to really strengthen the participation of young leaders, especially those from marginalized communities, to climate and environmental decision making processes. Um, and at the same time, we are also having sending a delegation to Bern Convention, which is a Council of Europe framework on uh, on biodiversity. So, uh, so I'm very very excited to be here, um, and I would be more than happy to go a bit more detailed. But uh, I will stop here because I will end up answering some of the questions you have for us. So back to you. Thank you, Pega. This was a uh, very nice presentation. Um, then, uh, Katarina, would you mind presenting yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Unfortunately, online, I didn't know that I could come to Müllerstraße. But anyway, I'm in Berlin <laughs> and I'm with you online. Um, in the back, you see our logo, Omas for Future, which is translated already by one of you that we are grandparents for future. And um, everyone can join us uh, who is uh, mainly over 50. They do not need to have grandchildren, but uh, everyone who is over 50 can join our organization. And uh, Yes, our origins are in Fridays for Future. So we are very close to the For Future movement and we support each other. And there are 40 For Future groups in Germany nowadays. So you have the artists for future, the scientists for future, and they are in every profession you can uh, found a, a For Future group. And uh, our Omas for Future is a quite big organization. We are in 80 cities in Germany. I am in Berlin uh, and we are a pretty great group. We have 120 grandmothers who uh, work together with us and our motivation is to save the planets for uh, the grandchildren, but not only for our grandchildren, but for all grandchildren of the world. And um, when I uh, heard the situation uh, about Senegal, uh, we are so upset that our chancellor is uh, traveling to Senegal to convince those people to uh, deliver natural resources to us in, in uh, the first world, although they could really build up a good system in Senegal to uh, support themselves. So, but anyway, we are, part of the three um, uh, parts, which is politics, industry, and we are the civil society. So we try to convince people that they can make a difference and uh, that they can also change uh, a lot by their own behavior. Um, we do this with uh, two quite interesting issues which is uh, a quiz concerning the future and it's a quiz concerning health and we try to convince older people you know some of you are a bit older uh, you know how old people are from time to time they are very convinced that they know everything and they try to to give the burden to the young people uh, so they say uh, 
the young should do it. Uh, they are in charge now. And we try to convince them that they are also, although uh, uh, obviously they are part of the problem, that they can be also part of the solution, which is not really easy, to be honest. Uh, so what we do and what I find interesting uh, to hear is we also work intergenerationally. So uh, the new project we are focusing is that we um, educate pupils to scouts for future, uh, which means we go into schools and we educate them that they can play these uh, quizzes by themselves. So. Uh, I think the, the greatest or the biggest problem of the future uh, movement is that we are too little people and uh, therefore we try to spread the news to everyone, not only to the older ones. And uh, yeah, uh, and it's great to hear your stories and maybe we can become more successful together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll go to our offline speakers that are here with us in the room. Um, I think you have the presentation of Anna. I have both presentations. I okay. think this one yeah. is first. Okay. Um, if you want, I can give you my computer so you can click through the slides uh, yourself if it's, uh, if it's better yeah, for me. It's easier. I can do that. Okay. So, Just use the, use the adults. <laughs> So yeah, hello everyone. Uh, broadcasting here from the very snowy headquarter in Berlin. I'm <laughs> very uh, thankful for the opportunity to join you in this discussion, and I'm very happy to meet you all also here in the audience. Um, wish we could all be here together, but at least we can see each other online. And also everyone who joined online the discussion. It's very amazing how many people you are. I'm a political scientist working for the Deutsche Naturschutz thing. That is, or you can translate it to, trying to slide exactly, to the German League for Nature, Animal and Environment Protection. It's an NGO, a non for profit organization, and we're working as an umbrella organization for about 100 organizations that you can see with this. Um, I can hear these are all our member organizations. We have quite big organizations like the World Wildlife um, Foundation and also very smaller organizations that are particular uh, caring for um, more particular food issues like um, forbidding pesticides in the agriculture industry or taking care of specific species like birds or um, other kind of species. Sorry, I didn't want to go too much to detail. Um, we have actually three departments um, focusing on climate and energy, um, focusing on biodiversity and the agriculture and uh, animal protection, and um, the European, uh, the EU policy department taking care of um, climate and energy and environmental policies in the European Union. And as we have the European elections of the parliament coming up next year, uh, my three amazing co-workers just um, started a campaign for the elections, gathering the most important um, demands and, and uh, political issues in their field from our member organizations and um, wrote an, a quite nice companion about what we have to focus on in order to maintain the Green Deal, in order to um, gain more progress for a more sustained and um, social ecological transformation in the European Union. And for the first time of the 73 years of the Deutsche Naturschutz thing, we were able to put a paragraph in these demands um, focusing on gender justice um, in, in regard that it is important to whatever measures we do and talking about, they have to be gender responsive as 
um, the climate crisis is uh, addressing women in a different way and affecting them and have a deeper impact on women. Um, and it's important to address that with uh, specific measures and also um, supporting it with specific financial um, support. You can download it also from our website if you're interested. We uh, translated it into English. Um, what I'm doing actually at the Deutschland Tuschitzring, I'm the advisor for the board and preparing the board um, with any political analysis and strategic um, preparation for them to take um, the decisions they have to um, do in, in order to, um, or more internal um, decisions within our organizations and also more external um, issues uh, towards the government or the ministries we are uh, interacting with. And I found out when I started working at the Deutsche Naturschutz thing that there are a lot of amazing uh, female experts working, but um, it's, yeah, it's about 70% in our organizations. Um, but if you look at the CEO level and the leading positions, it's mostly dominated by a white man, mostly, almost 100%, I would say. Um, which I don't want to be offensive towards them. They're doing amazing and great work, especially right now. But it is very important that um, gender justice among the German um, environmental organizations is to be addressed, as we know from several studies that um, gender uh, justice is also a huge contribution to uh, reaching climate uh, goals and climate neutrality and uh, reducing the uh, the, um, the emissions that are actually increasing um, the climate crisis. So I started doing research, interacting with our um, member organizations and started a network of women in our organizations and um, addressing what they need to um, do uh, equal work um, to raise in their um, companies and uh, also getting into leading uh, positions and right now I'm working with the environmental ministry in Germany to do a workshop next year to also address these issues. So um, in the long run, I hope we can uh, achieve gender justice also among our organizations um, as, a, as a role model among the civil society. Um, yeah, I think that's that's so far. I think uh, how women are differently affected by the climate crisis, we will have in the discussion later. So thank you. Yeah, I think I, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I didn't manage to, uh, to upload it, but uh, we will just uh, share the screen. First of all, if you use plus, yeah, if I know. Um, I'm not sure maybe it's because it's, um, it's hard. I'll just share the screen. I think it's my way. Really... Oh, okay, because you're still going to take on the way. Um, I can see it here. So. Um, Give us a second. <laughs> um, oh, I'll try to upload it. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to too much. <laughs> It's also our first time doing a yeah. <laughs> debate online, so please be kind to us. <laughs> During the evaluation that you will be redirected to afterwards. Yeah, yeah this one. Okay, I'm, I'm uploading one item. Let's see what it is. <laughs> um, I hope we can come back to oh, our presentation then. <laughs> Yeah, we'll try to do it. With a narrow, yeah? Yeah, with the, with the arrows, and then you can control it yourself. It's probably better. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about myself. 
but actually about the things I'm doing. All right, so how it started, very quickly, a little bit of history. Uh, I'm Polish and I studied architecture in Poland. I'm an architect and an artist. So back in the day, some uh, years ago, uh, when I lived in Poznan, uh, and studying or uh, studying architecture together with two of my friends, two girls, we established a little group called Sinus Three. Are you here? Yeah, yeah, it's me. It's me. <laughs> I'm on the left. Yes, it's a real photo from the year 2000. And uh, yeah, and um, because you you have to know that back then, back then, architecture was being taught uh, quite traditionally. Uh, people were really concentrated on uh, the tone on boring things and um, there was no environmental conscience in Poland uh, and luckily I could study also in London where I made my masters at the architectural association and I studied environmental design so coming back to Poland I thought I would talk about it nobody was interested uh, the teachers at my university they thought I'm crazy um, and then imagining with this white old man university in the world of architecture if you could have these three young women who talk about sustainability, who make videos and performances, this is part of our performance from a project called Reticulum, the concrete side of the world. And it was kind of a manifesto about uh, surfaces of cities which are being covered with a plaster so that earth cannot breathe, kind of. So we bought a few square meters of grass and put it in the main square in Poznan. And we just made a little performance. But that was something that uh, the, our school did not really follow. They did not went to the dialogue with us. So we said, all right, we'll just continue our work. Uh, so that was back then. And that's how it started. And then I knew that it's important to talk about environmental issues. Also in Poland, today, everybody's doing it. Today is nothing really special. There is a lot of art. There is a lot of environmental issues being discussed. But back then, it was not. It was kind of a, a challenge, <laughs> a funny one. Uh, so Sinus 3, we are still working together after so many years. Uh, but also since 20, oh, no, 20 years, yeah, no, a little bit more than 20 years, I'm working for a Danish NGO called Nordic Polka Center for Renewable Energy. And we are based in the north of Jutland. Um, this is the place, it's an aerial photo, and um, in June we were celebrating the 40th anniversary of Polka Center. Oh, okay, the, the, the place is existing a little bit longer, but 40 years of the structure of Polka Center as an NGO. And um, yeah, it's a huge land, and uh, Jutland is a fascinating area of Europe. It's wind and wind and sheep and wind, and mm -hmm. Polka Center. We have an international team uh, of people and um, yeah, and I'm working, yes, on the left uh, is my uh, late boss, Prem Megot. He was one of the really, one of the real wind energy pioneers in Denmark, uh, my boss and friend. And on the right, you have Janne Kruse, his wife. She's now my boss. She took over after he passed away. And uh, she's really a role model for all of us, even for my son. Yeah, it's like a grandma for him now. Uh, so she's the director. She's a strong woman. She's like really my idol, honestly. Yeah, I want to be like her. Uh, and so what do we do? Um, okay, all right. So what do we do? We are working, um, Focus Center is working to promote, of course, renewable energy solutions, uh, bottom-up solutions. We cooperate with scientists, with small and medium enterprises, but it's also a hands-on place. We have theory, we always get theory, but we also have a lot of um, places where you can really do things with your hands. We have a small wind test station, actually even two. We have wave test station, TV test station. So yeah, and we have a huge, um, a large program for education for young people. They can come in and learn and build with their own hands, which I think is quite important and relevant today because it's something different. If you see a picture of a PV panel, and if you really put it on, yeah, you put it with your hands. Uh, so we have that physical part. My role, among other roles I have, but the main one is to illustrate, as an, I'm an artist, so I make drawings. So I illustrate issues which are, <coughs> can I say, boring, technical, 
difficult. I put ideas into an image so that we can all understand it because it's important that people, if we understand things, then we can accept them. Yeah? So that's one of my roles um, at the Kalka Center. Um, we also have, okay, yo, hello. <laughs> What's that? What's that? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Why not? Why? No? Okay. okay. We also have projects in Africa, uh, especially for women. We have what I like about focus centers uh, projects is that they are simple. In this one, just shortly, yes, we do deliver a PV installation, but we are also teaching people on the spot how to maintain it so that people get this installation and it's their own. So they take care of it. They learn how to do it. It's simple, but somebody has to know how to do it. And as you can see on the drawing, <laughs> Uh, during the day, children are learning and the PV panel is uh, charging the battery. And in the night, it's the women who learn. After the whole day of work, during the day, they have time yeah. in the evening. So they learn in the evening, you know, in some countries in, in Africa, like Mali and Uganda, Burkina Faso, where we do this, um, the percent of um, illiteracy is quite high, especially among women. So that's why I think this simple solution offers them a possibility to learn and make the life easier as much as you can. Simple solutions. Yeah? So, but we also uh, <laughs> talk about different things. You know, women, women. You were talking about white old men. Yeah, you see, that's me. <laughs> a rare picture of a young woman. Oh, well, <laughs> young. it was some years ago, but however, a woman um, among men. It's quite difficult to push through. The louder you speak, like on the bottom uh, top left photo of, at the conference, I was really loud. It was in China, so it's part of the deal to speak loud because that's how they do it. But here we are promoting our book, which we wrote together with Preben and uh, Wolfgang Paltz. We were editors of the book. And it's a huge, huge book about a story of wind power of uh, modern wind turbines, which were developed in Denmark. So today what we see wind turbines from Vesta, Siemens, whatever, they were developed somewhere in Denmark. It's, it, it, the story is amazing. I'm a keeper of a huge archive of photos from the 70s and 80s of these people, how they were trying how to build these wind turbines. Why were they doing it? After the oil crisis in the 70s, some people thought, all right, we have no energy. What to do? Uh, I mean, we can sit at home and cry, but some people in Jutland thought, no, no, let's do something. And that's how uh, they developed wind turbines that we know today. And it was a long process of trial and error. Some machines did not work, but you can see also on the photo, top right, they were making models, putting on a car, driving on the field to, to test it. There were no test facilities. It was all new. The technology was being developed and I find it quite Fascinating that I have a, well, uh, I'm really proud, not proud, but I'm happy to work with people who did it. Well, Prem, he's not with us anymore, but uh, he was a fascinating person. Here you can see Prem on the right. He visited uh, in Poland in the, some 80s or 90s. Uh, Poland wanted to build a, a nuclear power plant in Czarnowiec. Now they want to build it again. However, yeah. And this is Jan, my boss. She's uh, protesting. Uh, she was also an activist. She's protesting in Chernobyl against nuclear power. And to be honest, I think it was Prigman who told me once, uh, because, okay, in Berlin, I'm also an activist yeah, for women's rights. And I was telling Prigman, you know, Prigman, we're doing these demonstrations in Berlin and this and that. And that's when Prigman said, it's great, do it. But being against is not enough offer an alternative, like we did with wind turbines. And I said, shit, all right, all right, all right, okay. So when, uh, when we are doing our demonstrations as Jewuchy Berlin, we are a Polish speaking feminist group since eight years. Yes, yeah. I'm a founder and member of, of our little collective. So I said, all right, yeah, of course we do protests, but we also do a lot of art performances like the one on the right some art elements, because again, <laughs> against is not enough. 
So of course, one could see how is that connected. We will talk about it later. But just keep in mind that in the European in the European context, women we can vote or we can study since only hundred years. We have a lot to catch up. We have, a, you know, like to become these white men. We have a well, maybe the the road is not such long. It's not long, but it's still only hundred years. That's why, but look at the countries. If I'm not talking about Saudi Arabia, but some country like Switzerland, women got voting rights in 71. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. All right. So basically I'm finishing, I think what is important uh, that we women, we unite. Yeah, that's what we are doing today as well. But we unite across borders because it seems we are all in the same shit, kind of climate wise and politically wise. So that's it, more or less. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Managed to come back to our presentation. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's working. Amazing the technology. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, go back here. Um, Yes, we uh, we asked uh, Magdalena Klarenbach um, to give us a bit more of an introduction to, to the general situation of uh, of women and persons. So we'll give her a voice now. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I was asked um, because I'm a researcher, a sociologist. And uh, my speciality are movements um, in terms of climate crisis to give you a bit of input on women and climate crisis. Uh, so it will be more general uh, presentation um, plus two examples which I found interesting for our debate today. Um, and I think when we start to think about climate crisis, we have to start with the idea that it's not gender net, uh, neutral. Uh, that is important to see that women and girls, they experience um, the greatest impacts of climate crisis, which amplifies existing gen gender inequalities. Um, as well, we have to consider that climate crisis is a threat multiplier. That's another important aspect of that. Um, it means that it escalates social, political and economic tensions in fragile and conflict affected settings. Um, and climate crisis drives conflict across the world. Women, girls faces increased vulnerabilities to all forms of gender based violence, including conflict related sexual violence. Uh, human trafficking, uh, child marriages, and other forms of violence. So that's that's the the general uh, aspect of it. Can you please um, give me another slide? Thanks. So I think when we start to think about the the uh, the issues or the aspects related to women and climate uh, crisis, we have to have the uh, intersectional approach which means that we have to consider women as a very complex category um, um, in which we have a crossroads of different aspects of climate crisis. Um, and we have to consider as well that the risks are acute for indigenous and Afro-descendant women, girls, uh, for older women, uh, for LGBT plus and IQ people, uh, for women, for girls with disabilities, migrant women and those living in the rural, remote, conflict and disaster-free uh, zones areas. Uh, so another slide, please. Uh, so um, I focus on eight different areas uh, right now. Um, when we talk about the climate, uh, climate crisis impact on women, um, you can see it on the slide. The first one is disproportional impact. I said that a bit at the beginning. Then we have a food security and agriculture. Uh, the third one is water scarcity, uh, health impact, displacement and migration, inequal access to resources, limited participation and decision making. 
it appeared in our uh, introduction as well, that, that uh, aspect and economic inequality. Of course, we can see that they are different as well. And of course, we can talk about it later on in our during our debate, but I considered those as a the, the basic ones. So if we think about the disproportional impact, um, it means women often face the higher risk of climate injected disasters and in extreme weather events. Um, this vulnerability links to um, factors such as poverty, inequal access to resources, social norms that limit women's mobility and decision-making power. Uh, in terms of uh, food security and agriculture, um, that means that climate crisis can affect agricultural productivity, uh, impacting, impacting food security, and women who play significant, significant roles in agriculture might face challenges, challenges during uh, due to changing weather patterns, water scarcity, and increased pest pressures. Um, next one, water scarcity. In here, women are primary water collector to many societies. Climate change exacerbates water scarcity, forcing women to travel longer distances to fetch water, impacting their health, education, and economy, economic opportunities. Um, in terms of climate, uh, sorry, health impact, women's health is often compromised due to cli cli climate-related factors, such as spread of diseases, extreme heat events, natural disasters. Additionally, pregnant women in particular might face additional risks. Displacement and migration. Here, climate-induced displacement disproportionately, dispro disproportionately affects women who may face higher risk of violence, exploitation, and loss of community support. Women-headed uh, households are particularly vulnerable to the context of migration. In terms of education, we can see that climate-related events such as disasters can disrupt education system. Girls may be more likely to drop out of schools, facing increased risk of early marriage and limited access to information and resources. Another one, inequal access to resources. So gender inequalities in access to resources, including land and credit, limit women adaptive cap capacity. Lack of secure land tenure can hinder women's ability to cope with changing environmental conditions. Uh, limited participation in, in decision making. Women are often unrepresented uh, in climate change decision-making processes at local, national, and international levels. This lack of representation can result in policies that do not adequately address women's specific needs. And I will um, present uh, you the interesting aspects of that uh, in a second. Uh, and the final one, economic inequality. Women, especially in global south, are more likely to be engaged in vulnerable, low-income employment. Climate change can disrupt livelihoods, affecting women's economic security and exacerbating existing inequalities. So in here we have the eight aspects of the climate change impact. And um, can we move to another slide, please? Here you can see um, quite interesting um, um, a chart uh, figure from the article about ecofeminism and climate change by Greta Gard. Uh, she is uh, from United States, from the University of Wisconsin. And um, she gathered uh, data uh, from different sources. You can see it below in data sources. Um, and she made some summary of the impact to women in different contexts, and you can see it here, uh, in terms of climate crisis. So the, the most important aspect is that uh, in, in the grass move, uh, grassroots movements, women are the majority. You here uh, see the data shows between 60 and 80 percent women are in, um, uh, are in the gra grassroots movements of of environmental organizations. Later on, we have the interesting aspect as well is that women tend to perceive environmental, environmental risks uh, as a more threatening. 
Another one is that uh, women uh, show greatest scientific knowledge to climate change. Uh, and they are they tend to express different concerns and potential solutions to problem. Women consider climate change impacts to be more se uh, severe as well. Um, they are more skeptical about the effective, uh, effectiveness of the current uh, climate change policies uh, in the solving the problem of climate crisis. Um, and they are not that um, not that uh, trusty in the scientific and technical solutions. They are more community and uh, uh, they are tend to be more focused on the community uh, solutions. Uh, and they are willing to change more into climate friendly lifestyles. Um, they are unrepresented in the, the climate protection policies areas. You can see here three of them, energy policy, transportation planning, and urban planning. Um, but they are in general unrepresented in the climate uh, change policies um, as well. Here uh, I can tell you the European Institute of Gender Inequality data. They show it very well as well. And women underestimate their climate change knowledge more than men. So here we have the, the general information. And um, I think another interesting aspect is to show two agendas, two agendas 21, uh, and their comparison of it, um, and how the that the that can the different approaches can impact the the policies as well that can be very interesting i know that it's not very visible i will go you through that so um, you can see four different categories consumption technology external debt and popularization uh, sorry popul uh, pop population so here are the categories in which the author analyzed Agenda 21. But first one is this one, which was prepared by women in the 90s. And the second one is the agenda prepared by uh, United Nations as well in the 90s. So what are the, this, the interesting aspects of those two documents that I would like to just uh, very briefly show you? So first one. Uh, if we see consumption, we have uh, women, uh, women's agenda 21, which women tend to respect more environment and society, and they tend to boycott uh, sustainable production and consumption model. Um, they are more perceived as a change makers in here. In the UN uh, agenda 21, women are more being in the role of consumers. And the policies are the, the aspect that changes the consumption model. And technology is important as well, very much. In the technology category, we can see um, as well in the Agenda 21 uh, prepared by women, technology is perceived as a destruction of nature. Uh, and it's not accessible on, on ethical and democratic um, level especially for women and the marginalized groups. And the UN uh, agenda shows technology as a benefit. Uh, this agenda reinforces research, uh, promotion of new technology, and um, but it's interesting in here that it uh, involves Global South as well, that it's mentioned here. If it comes to the third category, which is external debt, we can see the major differences in here. Uh, in Agenda 21, uh, prepared by women. Um, here, the strong um, input is on um, the global north that needs to admit to the exploitation of, of global south. Uh, and, and there is a strong criticism of International Monetary Fund and as well, uh, World Bank. Uh, in the UN, uh, UN uh, agenda, we can see that global south should pay uh, the debt, uh, the debt, the debt. Sorry, and but there is a positive approach towards um, cooperation to reduce it. Um, and the, in the last category, um, in the women's agenda twenty one uh, population, um, 
the reasons why we are in the situation um, of climate crisis um, is connected to military industrial populace together with the capitalistic system. Uh, in the UN agenda, the, uh, the, the problem is the population growth. Um, that's the reason on unsustainability, but the reason um, the, the solution is here, family planning policies, as well as the promotion of women economic independence and decision-making. And um, underlined is as well the war, war on the poverty, which should be a key factor in reducing democratic growth. So here I gave you um, a short example of different approaches and the, the approaches of women um, in the policies. So I think that's the end of my input for today. And yes, I'm giving back the, the voice to Camila. Thank you very much, Clara. Yeah, um, I think now the presentation and introduction part is uh, kind of over and we can get into our discussion. We can also get into uh, the questions. So also if our online audience has now something to add or wants to immediately ask a question, you can please use the, the chat for it and we will then forward it to the speakers. We have uh, somebody who has a question in the audience. Yes, uh, uh, I agree that uh, it's crazy that the women uh, are still discriminated because uh, we lose, uh, everybody lose, uh, men as well. But as uh, an Italian, uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, a question. In uh, the year 1743, there was in Trento the Concilio, where the Pope and all the Cardinal needed uh, to deliberate in this question. Are women human beings or are they the devil creature put on the planet uh, to rob uh, with their sexuality <laughs> men's souls. Well, thank God uh, <laughs> for three votes, women were granted uh, their status of human being, inferior but still human, because if they were declared devil creature, everybody can burn uh, women uh, and uh, uh, have a marriage uh, in the eyes of God. Now, my question is, in your opinion, uh, what is the best tool in terms uh, of the social construction reality to get out uh, of this craziness? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> And please go. Oh. Yeah, I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to quickly answer that. I can slide in here. Put your hand close to your face. Maybe we'll. So. It, it, it's okay. Yeah. It's yeah, fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I would actually get back to Clara's presentation. Thank you very much for the structured overview, and I would like to point point out um, the slide where you structured um, the impacts on women. And number seven is actually what I'm trying to work on also, that we need women on the table of uh, decision-making and we need uh, women in political decision positions. And that is very, very necessary. I think it's a complex um, construct we're living in and women are doing a lot of things on the ground and on top positions. Um, so every one of the speakers here has their own focal point to, to address and all together I think we're improving the situation overall. But I think and what I'm 
uh, observing is that it's absolutely necessary that women with their knowledge and their experience um, of taking care of family and having an education and um, are central actors of the social ecological transformation and without them on uh, doing the decisions, I think it is necessary to make progress. Yeah. So power, diversity, we need a diversity of power. Exactly. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Um, I, I see a lot of hands raised. Uh, I think, Pega, you, you were the, the next one. <laughs> wow, I managed to beat it. There was, there's quite a lot of competition there. Um, maybe I will just be very concise in answering one of the participants' questions. Um, well, <laughs> you went quite far back in history, I have to say. So that's um, that's something that uh, I cannot really comment on. But uh, I am personally myself uh, an activist on women's rights, uh, as well as I'm an environmentalist. Uh, I come from Iran and I was on the streets last year protesting for women like freedom. So I'm pretty sure you saw Masa Amini's posts everywhere. What maybe I can link back to the discussion that we are having is that the struggle for women is never over. It's we've always been see men have always been threatened by our voice. <laughs> Um, I don't know when it started or when it's going to end. I just know that we have to keep going and we need also men as our allies. This is what I felt uh, last year with Women Life Freedom, that uh, many men were fighting alongside with us and uh, they, were, they were dying with us in the streets um, throughout Iran. And that helped us feel less alone and I think this is a power that you have and maybe you don't realize. And also helping us with questioning the status quo is also another important thing. You know, sometimes in some places, the fight for women are for basic things, you know, to not be killed, uh, to not be um, murdered and all of these things. So for that you need to question everything and you need to fight for everything altogether um and maybe what i would ask of you as as females and males or how, whatever you identify with to still acknowledge the problems there don't think that because we're in this century everything is over no we are very very beginning in this fight and uh, and i think once you have that mentality then i think everything else would just fit in like a jigsaw um, and like I said, don't be fooled that you, that this fight is over. It's nowhere near it. Um, and there are many women, I'm sure, that are sitting in this room and online that are still struggling. Um, and I think once you contextualize it this way, then, then everything makes sense. But sorry, I, I derailed a little bit about climate. But like I said, this is a topic that you cannot just look in, in isolation. Thank, thank you very much. I, um, that's uh, that's true what you what you said. Um, I, there are still more hands raised, so I think we'll directly just give the voice to Katarina. <laughs> yeah, uh, girls, the future is female, and I think all the men feel this, and we have to stop men's planning and uh, we have to uh, just stand up be strong be united in our networks and uh, yeah it's still a long way but we are on the road i think this everyone knows this I'm sorry, sorry, Maxine, but I think Clara is waiting to, to add something first. Yes. Just, uh, just a small remark. Like, um, I, f for me, of course, we, we know that women um, are underrepresented in the decision-making processes. It means like 
and what I wanted to show you with, in my presentation, that we are in the movement, there's a lot of women in the movement, but still we are not in the place, not in the spot where actually we um, influence on the decisions. And I mean uh, grassroots movement, I mean the political, um, uh, political level as well. And uh, what I tried to show you as, one, uh, as well in this, this comparison of these two agendas, that there are two different approaches, that it's very interesting. Um, that in terms of climate, um, I don't know like how it would like uh, it would look like if we like give the the chance for the women to uh, to rule and make the decisions. Um, but I think that it can be very interesting to just like to to think about it actually how it can evolve uh, because as we can see this this attitude that I showed you in the UN is more technocratic. And the the aspect that uh, is um, on the on the side of women is more community based, more environmental based. It's more based on values, which is very interesting, and it's more liberal, liberal uh, as well. So I think that can be interesting and um, yeah, inspiring as well for us during this conversation today to think like. What can we do? Uh, of course, and it was one of the voices um, um, before, but I'm very interested in how it would look like, actually. Yeah, it's a more Im imagination uh, task right now, but I think it's very interesting to think about it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Clara. Uh, Maxia is waiting already. So. <laughs> Um, I am a bit surprised by the example that you used because you said that um, it was back in the 17th century that uh, if this vote didn't come through, women could get burned and no one would say anything. But actually that's exactly what happened uh, during the witch hunt for literal decades. And so I'm quite surprised of the example you chose and of putting it through because of the violence of the word um but yes and i would like to say that every time there is an election or a discussion whereas it's if it's in this uh, 17th century or, or now we must keep fighting all the time because one election can change and put us back in time so fastly it has happened with the us now that a woman cannot abort um as as they could before and I think yeah as women we we love um, we should unite and stand together but it's also like we don't really have the choice just because uh, our rights can be taken back from us every every time there's uh, elections and this is also I think why we're all so involved in the things we're involved in which is also what uh, Clara uh, uh, highlighted that 60 to 80 percent of uh, people working in NGOs or associations are women um, because we're feeling most concerned about it. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I think I, I know you were waiting to, to say something. Yeah, just, yeah. I, I like the question. I like that uh, history uh, question because it gives us a little perspective. Like before I was saying that women can vote since 100 years in some countries, in some countries shorter or not at all. I think giving a historical um, context shows us how deeply backwards we can still be and how quickly we can lose what we have. But we just need to remember that in many places of the world, women don't even have this, what we have here. So it's very all very unequal. And uh, well, part of this situation is, of course, it is religion. It's a, st um, a system, religious system, which can, which some of religions they simply don't like women, or they treat women like either a saint, holy mother, and a not saint on the opposite uh, side of the scale. Uh, some religions are simply don't they don't like women. How how 
why i see i really want a theory about it why is it so the woman a fascinating polish uh, feminist she wrote the book uh, maria Czechomska, and she said the reason why men don't like women to put it simple it happened many thousands of years ago when humans realized that a sperm is needed to create a human because before they thought wow a woman is a goddess she creates life Ta -da! she gives birth but when they realized wait a minute there's a guy needed to this then it changed i don't know if it's true obviously we will never know but i like to this metaphorical story the question is what can we do what can we do to change the situation should we ask men to make plates for us will they do it well we can use our elbows that's an option we can um support each other if we have women on higher positions they might these women can support other women just like men do it it's nothing unusual it's nothing really special to to help other women young women or we can um train uh, women to take their place because i mean even if men make plays, who will take it? There are many women who are shy to claim yes. the space. And we women should learn how to simply be cool with it. And just, if we know how to speak, let's just do it. If we have expertise and we have experience, we should not be shy. Just do it. Mm, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I think someone online raised their hands, so or maybe put them down. Katarina, did you want to say something? No? Okay. Sorry. But maybe we could, do we have a bit of a, a language problem, but maybe we could ask uh, Rana Zulaya yeah. what, what is in, in her community stopping women? What, what are the, the main issues? Okay. Uh, Rana Zulaya. I don't know how to formulate this question in English. Um, in French. In it's French. French. Yeah, we do it in French. <laughs> Can you repeat this in English? Yeah, what, what in her communities is stopping women? What are the, the main issues that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, don't let them to act in, in yeah. age or is it religion maybe, but maybe it's something that maybe it's men. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, so, on a today, on a sense, on a zip, you, uh, un des problèmes qu'on a en tant que femme, même quand on a l'espace de prendre le pouvoir, c'est qu'on n'ose pas le prendre. Euh, et du coup, euh, Camilla, elle se demandait si dans ta communauté, comme tu travailles avec euh, beaucoup de femmes, c'était le genre de même problème. Est-ce que les femmes ont du mal à prendre leur place Est-ce que tu as observé ouais, des, des choses particulières Ou est-ce que... Euh, euh, on disait aussi que les femmes ont beaucoup tendance à s'allier, à faire partie des associations. Est-ce que toi, c'est un truc qui marche aussi beaucoup Ou euh, comment ça se passe euh, dans ton association et dans les combats que tu mènes et que tu as menés Allô, merci. Dans mon association, ça, ça marche bien euh, parce que le, le, les, les ressources naturelles que nous, que nous, que nous conservons, euh, nous avons constaté que nos ressources naturelles sont en diminution, en dégradation, parce que à cause du conflit, euh, ces gens-là euh, utilisaient le bois pour aller les vendre dans les autres, dans les autres, dans les autres pays. Et actuellement, après la sensibilisation, nous sommes arrivés à diminuer la coupe abusive de bois. Euh, pour cela, nous avons mis, euh, après la formation des femmes en leadership et bonne gouvernance, ces femmes-là euh, osent actuellement euh, diriger, diriger des comités villageois qui protègent la forêt. Donc, ce sont ces comités villageois-là euh, qui protègent la les, 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 qui, les ressources. À leur tête, nous avons six femmes, six braves femmes qui sont à leur tête et qui dirigent ces comités-là par rapport à, ce que, à, à la régénération de la forêt. Parce que nous avons vu que nous avons, nos, nos forêts sont très dégradées, nos fleuves sont très pollués. Maintenant, ce sont ces femmes-là, accompagnées des euh, services techniques de notre État, les services de pêche, les services des eaux et forêts, et 
les sous-préfectures qui nous accompagnent à faire ce combat-là. Qui nous accompagnent à faire ce combat-là. Euh, pour cela, nous avons incité les, les, les femmes à renoncer à l'utilisation du bois de chauffe et prendre le charbon bio comme combustible. Alors, ce, ces femmes-là utilisent le charbon bio. J'ai même des photos que euh, dans l'atelier de, de, que les femmes sont en train de travailler avec ce charbon bio-là. Nous travaillons avec ce, char, ce charbon bio-là pour diminuer la consommation de euh, bois de chauffe et euh, utiliser ce charbon-là. Protéger nos forêts, parce que nous avons remarqué euh, une, chale, une forte chaleur et une diminution de pluie dans notre région. Donc, je crois que peut-être j'ai répondu à la question. Allô? Euh, merci. Est-ce que tu peux me Ok. Um... Euh, merci beaucoup. Il y a beaucoup de choses qui ont été dites, mais j'ai une question. Donc maintenant, tu dis que c'est des femmes qui sont à la, six femmes à la tête de ces comités de régénération des forêts locales. Est-ce que quand il y a eu cette euh, ressource naturelle vraiment en diminution, c'était encore des hommes qui, étaient, euh, qui géraient ce truc-là Oui, auparavant, les, gens, les femmes n'avaient pas accès à, la, accès à la ressource, surtout à la gestion. Donc, c'est les hommes qui c'est les hommes qui géraient. Les femmes n'avaient pas accès même à la ressource, surtout la okay. gestion. Maintenant, maintenant, après la, la formation, leur formation, la sensibilisation, euh, euh, les hommes en sont conscients que les femmes aussi sont, doivent être impliquées dans la gestion de ces ressources-là. Euh, parce que euh, euh, le genre quand on leur a expliqué le genre, ensuite la, le, 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 leadership, le leadership, donc ils ont compris que ces femmes-là, doivent, elles, doivent, elles doivent participer à, à l'évolution, à la protection et à la gestion. Elles ont leur mot à dire. Ok, je vais essayer de traduire. Um, so, uh, lots of things were said, but what's underlined, uh, underlined was that before uh, access and um, management of the resources was more accessible to men and that her and her association worked together to uh, make some information and some courses more available for women. And then um, because the natural resources are obviously uh, less and less in Senegal, it's especially the woods, And, uh, for example, the wood was sold to other countries. And uh, thanks to the courses followed by women uh, and led by women, um, um, some localities have been able to, um, to, to, yeah, to fight against this uh, abusive cutting down of the woods. And what uh, was uh, what uh, Ramatulay was saying that was very striking and interesting is that these women took the places of leadership, uh, and that now they protect the forests. So, um, as an example, she said that uh, now six farm, uh, six, six women. <laughs> I'm sorry, six women are uh, leading those um, committees of regeneration of the forests uh, locally and that they are accompanied um, and helped by the technical services of the state. Uh, for example, the fishermen, yeah, fishermen, the local fishermen, and uh, also the technical side. And yeah, so this is how women are taking back power in Senegal, so mm -hmm. thanks to this project. Thank you. Um, Yeah, when we talk about taking the the power, I I would like to hear a bit more, Anna, from from you because uh, you said you want to change the, the situation how it is in in the major NGOs and so on. But um, yeah, what is the what is the attitude? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, what, what is the attitude? I mean, we can, um, oh, there's so much to, to think about and, and, and so much history. Um, I, I would just quickly reconnect with what, what you have said and the historical um, example. I would still um, point out that among all progress and among, um, or despite all technical pro progress and the modernity and, and the development and the achievements we made, um, we still have femicides and women are killed every day, everywhere in the world. And the violence, the pure, raw violence against women never changed. It is still at a very high level. And even in Germany, every three days, a woman is killed by a male partner. So that is a situation that needs to change urgently and immediately in every female-led office, female-led movement, uh, female-led program, female-led uh, project is very important and is bringing um, a very huge part in the whole protection and simple protection of women. And, and that is what I observed, that um, the way men are leading and the way uh, men are taking decision is a very technical and raw way of decision making and not taking into account the 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 real sustainability of what life is what environment is what climate means or the climate change means and women due to our socialization um take it for good or for worse they are way more um aware of reproduction of the sensitivity of biodiversity of species of how to take care of the land the soil in order to feed their own family so we have that knowledge there and it's very important to bring that to the to the table for a real sustainable and just um, uh, society and uh, that is very important on a broader scale in order to maintain um, a just democracy and that we have to fight against now. Next year we have the European elections and the right-wing parties are very, very strong and you see it all over Europe and we can lose that. We can lose um, the justice, the freedom uh, of women and also the environmental protection and um, that is what drives me in my organization to empower women that we together um, take, take, not take over, but to be part of the decision-making progress because um, studies found out that women and, and nature and, and consider nature differently than men actually. So men are very technical <coughs> approach, um, plan, yeah. For example, renewable um, industry oriented uh, approach um, of, of saving the environment or the climate. And women have a very different view of that. They're taking care differently of the land. Unfortunately, women uh, own land way more or less than men and are also not in the decision making progress. So that's what we have to change. And you set some numbers and it's the same for us, it's on the on the working level. We have a lot of excellent women, smart women, absolutely trained, high skilled women. But in the decision, yeah, to, making part, they are not represented, and that is dangerous because the the knowledge, the knowledge of uh, the what is going on in ministries or in the government level, it stays within the small group of of men, and it's not shared with us. So. Altogether, together we can't um, and not be able to take the right decisions for everyone. <clears throat> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, 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 totally, I totally agree and, and this makes me uh, really, really curious, uh, Pega, how it is, uh, because you, you are, you're younger than, than most of us here and you work with young people, with uh, organizations run by young people. Is it the same? Is it, uh, or is it better? I hope. Actually, we, we in, in YU, we are struggling with other way around. We have too many women in our team. 
um, like you said, you know, it's uh, activism. So young young women especially feel more understood in non-for-profit areas than they would in, you know, um, private sectors. So for us, we are we are trying to actually find male colleagues who actually empower young women in in our team. And I think for us, it's very important that whilst we are trying to maintain gender equality in our team, we should also be very careful that we don't diminish the fragility of young women that are in our network um, because women are more self-critical, um, especially young women. They are more self-critical about their position in the society and the community. And when they want to approach decision makers, they, they tend to um, be less direct simply because the societies have given them that perception that you should be quiet, obedient. Um, and, and for us, when we were working with Fridays for Future, it really helped us to even have the courage to say that no, women have their own um, views here and they are equally um, uh, important and this is not about obedience. So I'm very, very proud to be a young person in this type of time of history, I would say, because I think if I was maybe born a little bit earlier, I would have not been so loud myself. Um, so what I'm seeing is that a lot of young women are taking the floors and platforms that they would not normally take. Um, to me, this is really inspirational. And something that we are still struggling with, though, is that, yes, women are, are more likely, actually, as um, Clara said, more likely to be attending protests, to be part of non for profits but they are still not showcasing the decision-making table. And maybe linking it back to elections, we have the European Parliament elections coming up. It's very important to see what is the number next to the list for female candidates. To me, this is something I'm a bit obsessive over. Um, you know, a lot of political parties put especially young women on the list and they tokenize that as a way to win votes, but they are yet not high enough on the list to be elected. So this is a very, very big problem. And, and we need to make sure that we really speak out loud about it, that having a young uh, or having a woman in your candidate candidature is not enough. They need to be really high on that list and they need to showcase that in the European Parliament com final composition, you have a very, very good diversity um, in, 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 in the final uh, composition. So we are trying to showcase that, but like I said, um, it's gonna be a tough few months, given the fact that we have a lot of right wing um, <laughs> increase. And uh, I'm very happy as a British that I don't need to worry about it, frankly, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I would be very embarrassed once again um, about the, the whole situation. But uh, at the same time, I'm also very sad that um, I lost access to a community that uh, I could grow in a bit more. So think about the British youth as well, especially about the British women. Um, Brexit has had a very, very negative impact on gender equality. So but this is, again, a topic for another day. Back to you. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry, I was uh, trying to coordinate things. Uh, I can see that uh, Dr. Marta Charlotta joined us. But before we, we uh, give her the voice, uh, Christina, you raise your hand. Do, do you want to add something quickly or, or ask a quick question before? Ah, sorry. Um, no, I just wanted to thank for these very interesting uh, presentations and just to joined to my to to the previous pigar uh, mentions because we also realize it in all our projects that the participation of women in all ngo based uh, projects dealing with um, social inclusion uh, art um, migration whatever topics we have uh, is really really the more and more important on the other hand, so we can see that there is a duality between these kind of NGO activist-based 
um, projects and 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 activities and ideas and innovations and on the other hand decision making but also the research part so as soon as you have a research project then uh, it's immediately this 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 situation changes and and um, let's say there is a, a different um, division between different sex and 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 opinions and I don't know if it's a problem or not, but that's for sure that that um, uh, this duality might be uh, uh, something that we we realize every day. So this is something we have to think about. Thank you very much again. Christina, um, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, before we go further in, into the discussion, uh, Magda, would you like to? quickly introduces also in, into the situation of, of women with disabilities uh, in the climate crisis. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry to be uh, joining you only now, but as they say, uh, it's better late than never. And it's it probably it's also a motto for including disabled women into climate justice movement. Um, I will I will uh, listen to the recording uh, after uh, the, the meeting is finished. So um, forgive me if I will say things that have been already touched upon. Uh, but from like the key takeaways, if I if I were to give you a key takeaways from the perspective of uh, disabled women activists uh, in relation to climate justice, is but is 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 actually pre pretty simple. Please include us in all uh, roundtables, discussions, workshops um, on the grassroots level, but also on a policy level. Uh, and it also uh, this this inclusion starts with accessibility, um, uh, because as as we all know, disability is not only uh, mobility issues, but also different types of disabilities. And um, unfortunately, human rights movements and even feminist movements have not been accessible enough uh, for our various perspectives to be included. Uh, so I would say the first takeaway is please do think about accessibility because it means for us uh, that we can co-shape um, how the climate uh, justice policies and um, initiatives uh, look like. And um, it won't be a surprise for you to 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 learn from me that when it comes to the intersection of disability, uh, gender and climate justice, um, women and girls with disabilities are disproportionately affected uh, because, um, you know, they have higher vulnerability. There's also the case, the issue of increased care burden. Um, by that, I mean that disabled women and girls are often carers uh, and it's uh, it's often a theme that is quite overlooked because uh, disabled women are tended to be framed in the mainstream as the receivers of care but in practice when we look at the statistics it's actually a lot of women with disabilities are caregivers so in the situations of humanitarian crisis for instance due to um, uh, cl climate catastrophe uh, women with disabilities um, have, uh, you know, um, increasing caregiving responsibilities uh, in emergency situations, for instance. Um, of course, there are, uh, you know, barriers to health services, um, which also um, uh, is important when we think about climate catastrophe, uh, limited economic opportunities, for instance, in the case uh, of you know, if there is a need for, for evacuation due to climate catastrophe. Uh, and then we, we again talk about humanitarian um, humanitarian situations. Uh, but because usually disabled women fall into a more impoverished category, they have limited economic opportunities, for example, to uh, to to um, to ev evacuate themselves because you, often you need money to to just run away uh, in, uh, in in very basic terms. Um, so there is a need for inclusive policies and support. Um, but also, I would say, I think the the thing that I touched um, by the previous speaker um, was about research, uh, and I think um, from a researcher's perspective. Um, 
what should be done is to try to combine the humanitarian studies uh, with disability studies, gender studies, but, but also climate justice studies. There is a lot of old overlap in lived experiences of humanitarian crises that are similar and that they, there are overlaps, let's say, with the, uh, with the climate catastrophe. So uh, in lived experiences, the humanitarian problems you know, overlap with um, uh, with climate justice issues. But when it comes to research, uh, what we often have found is that those uh, areas are being treated um, se separately. And by that, uh, the available data uh, that would make sense um, and would reflect lived experiences and needs uh, is, is, is not so uh, prevalent. So if we don't have, uh, you know, uh, good data, um, then it's really hard to to um, to propose uh, policy recommendations. So that will be a really quick uh, overview of a huge topic. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, that's I think really really interesting and, and very important. Um, and. Um, I think if I if I can ask you all like a kind of a closing going to, to the end of this discussion question is well we we come back to the elections and so we recently had elections in Poland and we've seen the situation that very long uh, women were not sure whether they're going to vote and I've seen the statistics and. It, it took a while and then finally, kind of in the last moment, uh, young people and women were the groups that actually decided to go and vote and, and I think were the ones that uh, that made the change. So now going further to, to the European Parliament elections next year, like what do you think are are the ways, what, what could we do to at least start in our communities or you have examples maybe in your communities, how to motivate women earlier to, and maybe more of them to, to yeah make this step and, and go and vote uh, what do they need to do this um if yeah maxine you want to start um i mean simply this project that we're doing <laughs> we're, yeah, trying yes. to, <laughs> we're trying to engage women more uh, together with Alcasa Pavel is also here represented by Clara and all the partners that are also uh, here today um we really try to raise the voices and um, especially through this uh, precise um, uh, discussion um but yeah, I think it's also things we said already, like trying to work together in association, um, create networks of women, which already exist, I must say, maybe not enough, I don't know. And and yes, I think Emma wants to go next. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually true also for the German elections that women uh, vote way more left than uh, for left, more progressive parties, no surprise, uh, than men do. But I worry that due to the inflation, to the high costs, to the pressure, to the uncertainties of also international conflicts and wars, also women, we lose the women on that side and that they could maybe vote more for more conservative <coughs> parties next year. So um, I hope we can talk to women and maybe stimulate their um, their idea of themselves as a political um, uh, political human being. I fear that a lot of women I deal with or talk to, they they still have this uh, very historical um, self identity <coughs> as a serving part, but not not as a as a political decision maker. And I would really like to change that that women. Um, yeah, fear themselves as a political important actor, and that they that they go to that side and feel that okay, if I vote, if I decide, if I raise my voice, then I can actually do something for myself, for my own interest, but also for the interests of the whole community. And I miss that at least in Germany. I don't. I completely agree. 
<laughs> completely. So looking at different levels of, of our society, if you talk about the women, like women, who should they go to vote or not, or, and you're afraid that we lose them, it's true. They should know that everything is political. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm not, it's not a political event, I'm not political. No, no, you are political, everything is political. It may not be party, a political party related something. But life is political, and we should not look away from it. We should recognize it, like you say. Uh, but so that's for the women in the society. If you look at other NGOs, like this event, it's very much needed. We need these events a lot, so that we meet. Maybe we do something together, and we network. And the example of Poland, it has been eight years of dark times again uh, dark times but on the civic society level it was eight years of hard work of activists from different groups people were active of course struggling as well and arguing but it was an effort of all the activists so hereby i would like to say thank you to everybody in poland to all the activists in poland thank you for your perseverance for your energy and work that we managed to change um, with this election, uh, this is situation changed. So this, thank you. So this is um, an activist level, but also we need these women to go and become a candidate. I'm saying it. Who will be elected if there are no candidate, female candidates? Don't be afraid, become a politician, uh, and we should support these candidates. Why not, everybody? Because if you're a candidate, you need support. That's what we should do. Um, so I think it's action on many levels, but some women have to be, go and be, be the candidate. I mean, somebody has to do it. Yeah, I'm gonna go now and do it. Yes, do it. <laughs> we will yes, support you if you do it. Somebody, you can't, you can't. Yeah. So you can't vote for you. Somebody, it doesn't matter. But we will vote for you. We'll find French friends. <laughs> yeah, we just need to overcome the gender pay gap, and we need more child daycare. Then it's easy. <laughs> oh yeah, that's another idea. Yes. Okay. Uh, is Lara available for the next Have some closing remarks. On, on the yes, sure. Okay, I think the, the, the Polish example is very good uh, and empowering uh, for this kind of conversations. I mean, showing that um, the part of society for so many years tried to change the government and it finally happened <laughs> due to amazing, amazing um, yeah, motivation of people. I think, especially the groups that didn't want to vote. So this eager and uh, you know engagement it, it was very important here. Um, that's 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 one thing. Second thing, in, in like I need to comment on on this political, you know, going to the politics, which I found really difficult actually. I mean, the culture and the language <clears throat> that is used right now in the political institutions for me personally, is very difficult to overcome. I mean, at some point in our activist um, work, we we consider being decisions make decision makers and, and trying to, to uh, be a part of the political institutions. And for me, the, the, the culture there is very difficult to, to yeah, to overcome. So I think that's that's one of the things that I would like to change first be, before uh, actually joining the institutions. The work, yeah, on the political culture. I mean, not only the the language, but um, the 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 idea of uh, the truth as well. Yeah, because I can't imagine like how much politicians can lie uh, nowadays, and that that's one of the things that is very difficult for me as well. Uh, but yes, I think the, the, this kind of meetings and telling each other what is important and the motivation to to work together is amazing. So that's um, I think that's very empowering. Uh, um, yeah, in nowadays, especially before the elections. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed for the results. Pega. 
I can't stop taking notes, so I'm glad <laughs> you gave me some time to actually stop uh, and do something else. Um, well, for me, I think there are, I would say the struggle is in two parts. First, for women, it's the personal barrier. So how do you perceive your role as a woman in a society? And then the second is the structural barrier that, okay, like I'm empowered now, I want to do something, but uh, how will my family perceive me? <laughs> if we start from that level, how will, if I go and knock on the door of a political party, do they even represent me? Do they give me the wings to express myself freely? So, and, and there is that. And then the third part is, okay, you assimilate yourself a little bit, but then you are still tokenized. So until we tackle these, all the elements of barriers, both personal and structural, I think you need to also cut women some slack. You know, you are asking them to be super women, and, but you are giving them nothing. You are just sending them some motivational speeches or your prime minister is um, saying women are the future, but uh, they do nothing. So what I would probably suggest to anyone who is, you know, listening to us is that you need to be part of pushing force to make those changes that if um, um, with the elections, if you are in a political party, demand that there is nothing, there is no element reflecting women, women who are disabled, who are um, at the forefront of activism, there is nothing reflecting it. So make that hurt. I know I'm very generalizing uh, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm asking for something that is very structural and embedded into history as we heard, but until we we get the assistance we need it will always be very difficult and and unfortunately i i cannot say that uk parliament really is the most glamorous place i can see myself one day i hope but uh, this is the reality that for women who are interested in politics they are often discouraged so how do we how do we deal with that and i think gathering together like today and 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 maybe we change we convince one woman from this meeting that they would stand for a, for an election so i think we also need to realize that sometimes the changes we make are one life at a time and i think as an ngo you get used to that that you change a life at a time and then when you do like an election you realize whether you influence enough lives for it to count a lot of times you realize, no, that wasn't enough, but that's a good encouragement to come back and do it again and do it again. Um, this is how I have felt uh, working with young people that teaching one young person about environment or empowering one young woman about how they can stand up for themselves is a life changed. And I think if we go that way, we all have a personal task to do after this meeting. So go and change your life at a time. And I think this way you would feel a bit more fulfilled as well. Okay, back to you. Yes, um, I, I agree. And uh, as we try, try to do it myself in my private life. Uh, so yes, 100%. Um, to uh, our other speakers would like to add something. Or, yeah, Katarina, please. Uh, I also like the uh, Polish example, and if we succeed in just uh, raising the participation or bringing more people to uh, get up in the morning and to vote, this could also uh, become a big, big uh, success. So, but there are only five months left, so we have to hurry. And what we do as grandparents, we meet tomorrow in Brussels to uh, form a European grandparents um, group, which is also very important. And what I would, what I would like to do after this meeting, that I would like to uh, network with uh, Anna Reuchen and Anna Krenz here in Berlin. So maybe we can put something together uh, for the next five months and become successful.
Yes, uh, de definitely. And uh, we want to be a part of this networking. Please, Please if you can do this. Um, Magda, Charlotte, would you like to add uh, something to it? You have to can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I agree with, with most of what have been said already, but um, one thing that I would like to add from my perspective and my experience with working, especially with emerging uh, leaders um, in Poland, in, U in Ukraine, um, is the importance of highlighting, for instance, the Charter, uh, Charter of the Fundamental Rights, um, the EU Charter. Um, it's an important document, but I think for young people, it is um, crucial to understand that it's not only words on paper, but actually these are the core values um, which uh, are worth fighting for, not only from the grassroots perspective, but also worth uh, fighting for from within uh, the policy uh, making um, sector. So uh, I would say that it's, it's sometimes good uh, to go to the basics, for instance, um, to the charter and make the charter great again. Thank you. Yes, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, I think we would like to still ask Ramadulaya also if she has something to, to yeah. add to it. Um, oui, donc du coup, on était en train de parler un peu des conclusions et des dernières choses que vous voulez rajouter. Est-ce que Ramadulaya, tu voudrais rajouter quelque chose? Okay, while well, well, we're trying to solve this problem. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Allô? Yes. J'ai pas, pas compris la question, s'il vous plaît. Répétez la question, s'il vous plaît. Um, la question, c'est qu'on était en train de terminer la réunion. On voulait savoir si, euh, comme on a demandé à, à toutes les personnes qui ont parlé, si tu avais quelque chose à rajouter. Voilà, on a plus dit qu'il fallait que les femmes soient ensemble et fassent plus d'actions ensemble. Est-ce que tu as quelque chose à rajouter comme, comme conclusion pour avoir ce métier Merci. Ok, ce que j'ai à rajouter, c'est peut-être appuyer encore les femmes qui sont en milieu rural sur euh, la protection de nos ressources. Parce que nous avons remarqué actuellement que il y a des règlements climatiques parce que actuellement on n'a pas assez d'eau et puis l'eau arrive un peu tard et nous avons perdu beaucoup de ressources, beaucoup de ressources dues au conflit casamancé. Alors si nous pouvions avoir quelque chose pour continuer la sensibilisation et trouver une alternative par rapport à la coupe abusive, le dérèglement climatique et aider ces femmes-là à pouvoir subvenir euh, à, leur, à leurs besoins par rapport à l'environnement, la protection de l'environnement, parce que c'est un, une région de cultivateurs. C'est une région qui, euh, qui, 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 euh, se, qui est basée sur ses ressources naturelles. 
C'est une région qui, qui n'a que ses ressources naturelles pour survivre. Euh, vu le conflit qui a sévi pendant presque 40 ans, la région est affaiblie. Donc, nous n'avons nous, nous euh, euh, que nos ressources pour survivre. Et vous savez, en Afrique, la femme n'a pas accès. Donc, c'est un combat. C'est un combat pour, que, pour euh, arriver à accéder dans les instances de décision. C'est un combat pour accéder aux ressources naturelles. Parce qu'actuellement, même, même ce qui concerne le foncier, la femme n'a pas accès. Donc, nous sommes en train de lutter. Nous sommes en train de mener un combat pour que les femmes puissent accéder aux, aux instances de prise de décision pour que les femmes puissent exprimer leurs besoins par rapport à nos ressources naturelles, qui sont des ressources que, euh, que nous partageons tout, tout, tous. Donc, euh, c'est ce que j'avais à ajouter. Merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Um, so, I will Um, so, um, what uh, Hamad Jai said that is very important and that all of you actually highlighted is um, um, the fact that it is a uh, fight that uh, needs um, sorry, intersectionality. Um, because, um, for example, in the rural um, areas, um, which also represents where Hamas is, um, we have to protect women. So I think, yes, really, uh, she's talking about, about this um, intersectionality and how different women are affected by climate crisis. And what she was explaining is that in the region where she's living, there's been a conflict for 40 years. And uh, because of that, um, now what is um, staying are the natural resources and that they are less and less of them and that um, in, in order to survive and especially uh, in her Senegal, uh, they have to keep fighting on, keep um, being together and, um, and um, fight against the dominating uh, powers because women cannot always have those uh, leading um, positions. So yeah, I think it's um, reinforcing the inter intersectionality side that we, uh, you have all uh, talked about. Yes. Um, thanks, Maxine. Um, <laughs> thanks, Abadulay. <laughs> um, it's already uh, eight, but I, we just have one more slide for you, uh, mostly just to show you the, the ways how we can keep this cooperation and this discussion going because it, it's not the end. Our, our project is, is going uh, further. And then if you could make a, a full screen for us here uh, of the presentation. Um, yeah, so okay, poster competition, uh, not important right now, but we do have a poster competition. This is also a way to, to engage and then show your voice. Uh, you can find the information on our website. Um, but more importantly, in spring, we will have two more debates where we will uh, discuss the energy and, and food production. And if you are in Netherlands or in Sweden or, or just can get there, you can uh, join us for that. And of course, there will be parts that you can also join online. Um, for us, very important in, in May next year, we are, so shortly before the elections, we are meeting again here in, in Berlin. So an, another option for us to, to, to do something big together. Um, yeah, we, we will also, will have a, a closing meeting in, in Brussels later. Um, also another way of, of showing us and showing this, this project to the politicians, so maybe even stronger. Um, yeah, and, and we will continue working on, on the political parties' positions to give the information to, to women to actually have some background uh, to, to be able to vote and to know who to vote for. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, I mean, we, we will also follow your comments and suggestions on, on Kialo and we'll try to take as much from, from this discussion as possible and work on it to, to make it better next time. So. Um, final remark, when you will leave the meeting, you will be redirected to the evaluation form. Um, it would be very important for us if you could fill it in to, for us to get your um, insights and to then organize better our next events. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, um, and, and ooh, there's a question. Uh, uh, from Pega, uh, we we are working on a newsletter. We we have a website uh, where we try to post information. We are also quite active on Instagram. So if if you find our project uh, Instagram, there you can find a lot of information. Um, and now we are in contact, and then hopefully we'll continue. Um, yeah, th thank you so much to to our speakers here and and uh, online and. So